started two new businesses from scratch. Definitely do not recommend it. On this week's episode of the podcast, we have Jerome, the owner of Madison's Fitness with over 400 plus clients and a thriving coffee shop under the brand Minka. One of the phrases I use with the team a lot is dominate the postcode. So as a brand, we want to dominate the postcode. I was paying for 18 years old, from 100 to 150 pounds an hour to work with various different mentors. And I wanted to just know how they were doing it. Pick their brains on nutrition, on training, on programming, anything. If I was studying for my own growth, I loved it. I was building Minka as a customer. What do I love about good coffee shops? And I, I know based on all my experience running a gym, we can deliver great experience. Minka had to be a separate entity and we treat it that way. All they know is what they see online. So they've seen social media, they've seen the website. They don't truly know Madison's. Jerome, welcome to the Fitness Marketing Agency podcast. You've had the shortest commute to the podcast studio because your gym is right next door to the FMA office. Can you just tell everyone who's either watching this on YouTube or listening to this on other audio platforms, uh, the business model uh, that you have right now, the businesses that you have? Sure, yeah, so Madison's, we're a large group and small group facility, uh, currently servicing about 450 members. Um, and of that, about 400 are kind of regular monthly members. We use about 3,000 uh, 3, square foot of usable like training space, a pretty big facility. And then next door, we own the, the uh, kind of like sister brand, Minka, which is a coffee shop, kind of high-end uh, bougie coffee shop, um, which we use as kind of a, a way to build our community. It's our social space. And that is also another kind of uh, 1,400 square foot there. So We'll send uh, the FMA team next door to film so people can visually see this on, on YouTube. But can you just talk us through the layout? So if I turn up uh, for the first time to the changing rooms, uh, the flow of where everything is sort of located? Yeah, sure. So we basically, the, we're, our facility is, uh, there's a residential block. So we're at the bottom of a residential block. And when it was first built, it wasn't necessarily built for uh, commercial use or gym use at all. Uh, so we have, it's a bit of a unique situation. There's, there's four four individual blocks three of those are for madisons and this and the fourth one is for minka coffee shop so if you enter through our reception uh, changing area that is uh, a combination of the reception changing area and office you would have to you can go in there change etc but you'd have to leave that uh, that area to then walk down the street a few yards to then enter like our studio one and we have Studio 2 next door. So the two gym spaces, we call them Studio 1 and Studio 2 to separate personal training and then large group training. Uh, but they are in separate rooms. So um, separated by walls. You can't hear music either side. You'd have to leave one to get to the other. And then Minko, again, stands alone as a separate business in its own like kind of a fourth unit. But they're all next to each other. And if you're listening to this, I highly recommend that you just jump on YouTube to see the visuals that we've put alongside this so you can see it. Um, can you just talk through the Studio 1, Studio 2 uh, and what the difference is? Yeah, so studio, ultimately it is at its core personal training and then large group training. Personal training for us is, uh, we, we, do, we do do some private one-to-one, -one, but the majority, 95 plus percent, is small group personal training. And for us, that is one to four. So we have four training pods in that, in that space. Um, and we can, so we could have four sessions of four. Um, and then large group training next door is a combination of strength and conditioning. Seven days a week, various different large group sessions. And yeah, a seven day schedule. So a lot of the FMA team are members of Madison's. Can you just go over the price points of the variant services that you offer? Yeah, sure. so at the moment, uh, aside from kind of like intro, various trial, like paid trials, following that, your our large group memberships kind of sit in the range of £129 a month all the way through to 229 um, for, with various kind of access. And then small group PT, you're looking at kind of like 289 all the way through to... 399 again for different access uh, a lot of our members so out of the kind of like 400 like monthly members it's almost an even split so just like kind of like 200 200 of the small group members a large majority of them will also as well as their small group pt maybe do a class a week or two classes a week and then we, the other um, large group members typically those 200 like large group will only come for large group training um for their various reasons on the timetable, how many uh, classes are available and then how many PT group PT slots are available sort of per week? So we have in total sessions, 800, I know on a monthly basis, we have like 810 sessions, weird number, but across the month. Uh, typically for PT, we have 10 or 11 uh, sessions a day. They were pretty much run every hour on the hour. So from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., personal training is running. Apart from 1 and 2 p.m., we do every hour on the hour. So quite a, a big schedule. Personal training runs... So Monday to Thursday, all day schedule. We also do Friday and Saturday mornings. No PT on a Sunday. Whereas large group training, we do seven days a week. So similar, Monday to Thursday, we kind of run an all day schedule, but we just do the mornings on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And that was a decision we made not to kind of do the evenings on Fridays and a weekend since COVID just based on demand, but we have the option to add that in later. 
Can you talk through the team in terms of how many you have, the roles that they play? Yeah, for sure. So uh, total 11 team members, including myself. So of that, nine are um, either coaches, still coaching. I'm one of those nine. The other two are office-based. So we have, in terms of... uh, main team seven are uh, full-time coaches we have a club manager Tyler who is predominantly completely off the floor until uh, unless he's needed for kind of any sort of introductory sessions we have myself managing across both Minka and Madison's and then we have two uh, team two members in the office one has been with us five or six years Kate so she works all in operations helps us with all things HR contracts ops and then Georgie's front of house and is uh, in, 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 the, in the business all day every day well five days a week. Uh, so yeah, two non-coaches and the rest of the coaches. Let's talk about the product that's actually delivered in the classes and then in the PT. Who's responsible for that programming and what's the sort of feedback that you've had from clients and sort of the transformations that they've uh, achieved following that program? So real mixed bag. We have so out of the members, with, with when people join, they have such varying goals. So um, for our small group side of the business, a lot of people, um, a lot of that audience are typically general population, struggling with their fitness, would have struggled to get to the gym without us. So they're kind of looking for a some sort of result, uh, physique, sometimes just health, mental health, physical health, whatever. But they often are a bit nervous about joining the gym. Even a gym like ours, they're quite intimidated, but and they want to be shown what to do, how to do it, and they want to feel comfortable really in that environment. Um, on the large group side, these are pit typically, not everyone, but we often find they're more fitness motivated. So people that come to large group training uh, or that if they're adamant from day one that they want to do the classes or large group, they typically are, I, I would consider them as fitness motivated. So they would probably train without us, but they just love training at Madison's. So that doesn't speak for all of them, but a large majority would train whether Madison's existed or not. We just make their experience much better and they probably enjoy training with us uh, over other places. So they're more sophisticated buyers of fitness. They've bought fitness before. They par- participate in fitness Definitely, currently. Yep. And then they just slot into classes uh, pretty easy. 100%. So I've, I've had experience at other kind of class-based gyms, boot camps, or if they've been training in the gym, they might be following some sort of program. So definitely more sophisticated, kind of know what they want. Know what uh, but they also potentially, with that audience, have trained for a long time. They know what they're doing, but they just find the gym on their own boring. Ultimately, they're going to train for life. So they find that they'd rather just enjoy that. So... Um, they can come along to a Mads class, have a bit of a social, but also get the work done, haven't got to think about it. Um, going back to the small group side, the, these a lot of these individuals probably would not train without us. Again, not speaking for all of them, but a lot of them, it really helps that they're booked in via the app. They know that we're expecting them. We're going to hold, uh, ha- hold their hand a bit more, check in with them to ensure they get the result. And they do really rely on that kind of guidance from the coaches in the sessions and, and out the sessions. I mentioned it already, but a lot of the FMA team are members of Madison's. Uh, I personally go to PT and classes. Let, let's talk about the, the schedule of uh, the programming. Um, so who's in charge of that? So it's, so it's a kind of a, a mixed bag. So with small group, is head up, head up, at the moment, small group PT is, uh, the program is run by our head coach, Vincent. So he is the guy that will kind of prepare a 10 to 12 week block for all our PT members. But ultimately it's a collaboration. So what will happen is he'll go away and write the program. Anywhere from three to five weeks out from the next block starting, he will run it past the team. So we have almost like one to three drafts. So he will send the first version to the team for them to look over it. And then in the team meeting, we can kind of chip away and uh, and break it apart. So we have three to five weeks to refine it before it's then released to the members. So Vincent, head coach and head of small group training will take care of that for the PT side. Again, and then the team have their input. With large group, it's been a, a kind of like a split um split assignment for a few members so for, for the last couple of years it's kind of moved around but we'll have because there's so many programs for large group we have maybe five to seven different concepts across the week we like to spread that responsibility across different names so we've got and you've met all these guys so we've got jake will and lily who also split that responsibility and then what we like to do as we grow and we scale we'll probably have other coaches that show interest and then as certain members become more senior they might want to hand that over to some of the junior coaches we like we really like it to be collaborative though so they'll kind of create their first versions and then we always talk about it as a team and then we'll run a program and then as we start to see the first weeks like first few weeks in action we often refine it so we'll kind of launch a program we think we've nailed it and then we'll see it almost break a little bit in the first weeks of usage and then we'll, we'll, we'll tweak it 
Let's talk about the time length of uh, sessions. Let's uh, focus just on PT. What does a typical PT session look like and how long does it last? 50 minutes. So all sessions are roughly 50 minutes. Um, so we run, because it's a six day, it's Monday to Saturday. We often have a week A and a week B just to create some variety for the members, but enough consistency to make create progress. So we will have, like I said, a program set out Monday through to Saturday. We've, we've done this for years now. So kind of programming for small group coming on, eight years, nine years of programming. So we've tried lots of different things. Ultimately, how we do, we tackle programming is full body sessions. We create some sort of structure. So on paper, it will look generic, but the coaches have to be good enough to personalize everything. So we have today on, on very like today, every member that steps through that door ultimately on the screen will see the same program. However, it doesn't quite work like that. So every movement is uh, more of a movement pattern rather than an exercise so the coaches can personalize depending on who's in front of them. So they can use their kind of skill set and brain and experience to make sure that members have a personal experience. And even if it has a full body program on the screen, it doesn't mean that every member will do full body that day. We have people that come in with more specific goals. They might have an injury. So the coaches, again, will work off that kind of like general um, structure and then make sure that member has a personal experience. Yeah, I've been in there when there's been like 16 people training in, in the pods of four with one coach and you can see like maybe the the pattern is a squat and um, so everyone's doing a squat but just different variations right based on their fitness ability like injuries or, or their goals and um, you can see the how the coaches are sort of interacting and uh, you know talking to the, the clients to make sure that they're getting uh, the most out of it so 100 yeah and the guys will have a huddle in them every morning we will look at the time table so we know exactly who's coming in for personal training. So every uh, first thing in the morning, so the guys arrive at like 5.30, before our first session kicks off at 6, they're already, they have the day planned out. So they, they as a, from the member's experience, the member just books a time. So a member will just book a time slot. They don't know which coach they're coaching with. But the coaches, before 6 a.m., will list out exactly who's training with who, and they'll decide based on either the member's experience. So they'll put members together based on personalities they think they'll work well together or they might think actually look there's um we've got a couple of beginners and actually let's put if it's a group of four we'll put these two more advanced guys with the beginners they'll have a reason for that and it might make the session flow better for everyone so they'll make a decision based on again experience and what they know of the members uh they'll we know exactly who's coming in that day so they have a, a kind of like a pre-discussion so just say um I was taking a session and I hadn't trained you before. We can, the guys would be telling me exactly what you've done previously, if I need to be aware of any injuries, just like any good, just in small group PT, communication between coaches is vital. So they'll do that every single morning and then throughout the day as well, because obviously people can book on last minute. So that's why, that's really important in our facility because we want to make sure that everyone is getting a good service and because ultimately members can book with different coaches, that communication is, is, is really important in, in our space. Why do you do it that way and not let the members book on with specific coaches? How, what, how comes it's like random? Good question. So we, we two, there's a couple of reasons. One, mostly for the business. So what we found, uh, and there's no, some places might do it differently, but we found moving from my background back in the day with one-to-one -one, uh, training, a lot of people, one-to-one -one coaches will build their own client base within a gym. And obviously to, we need to look after the business, like kind of business health and protect the business long term. So if a coach builds up their own client base in a gym, but then they leave and that could be um, move the area, decide to take another job, whatever. If they leave, they ultimately, those members might go with them, which is fair enough. I was a one-to-one -one coach once, had a really core amount of clients, but they might leave with that trainer. So it's kind of, it protects the business, but also equally, we want to have a product where it's good enough that other co coaches can deliver it well. So we, as a member, we find if a member had the option to train with the same coach all the time, they just naturally do that more often. So they think that's my favorite coach, they're the best, and, um, but they haven't tried anyone else. So we find it kind of forces people to work with different coaches. It also forces us to make sure we are really good and aligned so that no matter which coach they get, the, se the, the sessions are great. So we need to, it kind of like challenges us, but ultimately uh, all of the reasons do protect the business long-term. It makes our product better, but also means that Again, if a, coach's move, if a coach moves on, the members are more bought into the product, the people and the place rather than that specific coach. You see it like far too often, like Monday at 6.30 in another gym, sessions jam packed and it's because Bob or Jane are taking it. But maybe the next day, uh, 6.30 session, you know, Sarah or Paul are taking it and that session's empty. 
because the gym is allowing um, the members to see the name of the coach yeah. and then people are used to a habit and they start following that one coach and it does lead to a disaster uh, long term so yeah for sure i mean i'd rather w w uh, my approach would rather be like we we i can speak to the members get lots of regular feedback and see like right if i asked enough members like who who tell me your top three coaches or like your who, who do you like training with the most and then i'll try and listen really deeply listen to the reasons why build a picture for myself and understand right because everyone has their strengths and weaknesses, right? So some members will prefer certain coaches on certain days and other coaches on other days, or they might have a favorite, but I want to understand why that is because there might be something that coach is doing. It could be their attention to detail. It could be the intensity. It could be their friend, their, their communication, but whatever the reason is, that will benefit the rest of the team because we, we, if we ask enough members, they would all have different favorites. But if we can collectively get the reasons, that will ultimately help us as a, as a business in, on the whole. I think that strategy could work in some places you might have in a city like a, Lon a London uh, gym where they might be classes only and maybe the trainers are on commission. Uh, I don't, some bigger brands might do that. And then obviously it's in their interest to do that. But I think for a lot of our other models, it doesn't seem to work. I, I would probably, I would much prefer to do our version and then just get the feedback. Let's switch to Studio 2, which is the class-based uh, studio. Um, earlier, you mentioned different concepts of classes. Can you just break down what those are? Yes, yeah, so at, at, at its core, what we do at Madison's, we do, so because we're a seven-day schedule, Monday, Wednesday, Friday are strength classes, and then Tuesday, Thursday, and the weekend are what we class as conditioning or cardio. So on the strength days, um, we want, we have to bear in mind that we are training large groups. So obviously there are limitations, but we want to deliver for those members that are only large group members. Our, we believe in strength training, so we want to make sure that we deliver our best possible version of strength training in a large group. So we have a class called Hustle. It's set up in a similar, it's, it's most similar to our PT in the sense that we have, um, th we have like a superset fashion. So with Hustle, we have three main like working sets. They're all supersets. So you're, you're gonna get through six like big, good movements. Um, there are time constraints because it's a class, we need everyone to flow through it. So you'd have four working sets. There's a certain like kind of like time limit for you to get through the working sets. Um, and, and that's it. So there's certain movements we we won't do in hustle because it is a large group. But there are lots, plenty of good compound lifts that we do do. So people, if they turn up every week, they will without a doubt make good strength progress. And that's the idea. Um, and on the conditioning days, these are about getting heart rate up. It's a, it's social. It's team team workouts. It's obviously programmed as well properly so that people will build their fitness. The idea with the cardio sessions. Tuesday, Thursday, and the weekend, they are quite similar in ways. You're going to do a combination of uh, cardio kit, so you skier, throwers, bikes, etc., as well as like some dynamic movements, all the good stuff, thrusters, snatches, all that kind of stuff, if it's appropriate. Um, but the idea is that they are also programmed so that we want people to be able to turn up to them. They can just have fun and have a workout. So if you're not really, that, you don't really care about programming or making progress, you just like to turn up, tick the box, and have a good time, That you just turn up and you'll have a good time. But equally, if you're someone that does want to get fitter, get stronger, if you turn up to our sessions, just just turn up. That will happen because we've done the we put the thinking behind it. We've programmed it to make sure that happens. Let's go back to the, the team. Um, so regularly, I will walk past the gym, like going to get lunch or, or popping into a coffee shop, and I see the team like meeting all the time. So what's the cadence of of meetings that you have? So um, as a unit. So there's like micro stuff throughout the week all the time. I said pre sessions, post sessions, mini conversations always happening around the members. Um, that happens constantly, all the time, all day. But the actual like core team meetings we do uh, two two a week, one on a Monday, and one on a Wednesday. The one on a Monday is focused around uh, members and kind of the, where we're at with members, trials, etc. So we're predominantly talking about members, their journey, and events. On a Wednesday, we say it's purely CBD. So Wednesday, there is no chit chat about anything else. It's just a, CP, a planned CBD session. So we have Vincent, our head coach. Um, take the team through something every single week. It's planned out thoroughly. So we have our next year scheduled. Um, so he will, every Wednesday, basically sit with the team. Often it's practical, sometimes theory. They'll go through something together as a unit and then he will give them homework, maybe a Loom video. They will then, he, they know what's coming up next week and repeat. So he does that every Wednesday and Monday is just member chat. I think going back to what you said earlier, um, the clients come in at 6 a.m. for PT or, or class but the staff are arriving at half five to get everything ready, to meet, to set out the day. And so many gyms, literally the gym owner or the, the 
the PT who's taking that class or the PT sessions will rock up at like five minutes to six. Uh, they'll go into the building, like there's no music on, um, the gym's dirty from the night before, uh, the sessions are not on the whiteboard or TV, uh, and then clients start turning up. And you know the level of service that you um, consistently just have uh, with the Madison's uh, brand and, and what you've built is, is like superb to a, to a high level. And others in the industry should, should pay attention and watch what you do. Let, let's go into that level of service and, and what you do. So uh, as a client of yours, um, it's, it's the little things for me, like one, it's always clean. Um, so what is the rotor? What, what, what's your emphasis on this? So for a long time, so we have, so uh, as of today, we have clean, external cleaners coming twice a week. And we have the, the team take care of it the rest of the time. So we have a set schedule for them to, because obviously you've got to fit around hours. So we have two, a cleaning firm come in two nights a week. So when we shut down, they come in and do a deep clean. That makes sure, because of the usage we get, we probably need to increase that now. We're noticing how many members are coming through the door. It actually needs probably more than that. But they come in, they'll make sure in both studios, flooring is done to a great level. All the corners, all the edges, all the mirrors, anything like that is done properly, the bathrooms. But um, we have... So that's just the studios. We have a cleaner every day in the changing area. So every day without fail, um, a cleaner comes in for a couple of hours just to take care of the change rooms because they get regular use. So that that's that's a absolute non-negotiable cleaner every single day in the changing areas. We then as a team take care of that. So we have various, it, it varies, but we'll have like a, um, a deep clean once a week. We'll have trainers like there's certain tasks they'll do uh, at certain parts of the week so there's certain but every day we're refilling things we have checklists a weekly checklist sorry a daily checklist a weekly checklist a monthly checklist are vital because it just removes any thinking out of it we just just tick the boxes simple so daily weekly monthly was something we implemented years and years ago highly recommend it if you haven't got a, a, a checklist for cleaning in your gym do it immediately um it's, it's a no-brainer well like clients will leave and they'll tell you you know I, i'm leaving because i can't afford it anymore but really it's because like there's no toilet paper in the toilets or the gym's like full of sweat and hair or there's dust all over the dumbbells and there's little things like attention to detail which is crucial and you, you have that covered every time I, I walk in and other people say it to me as well um the team are also uh, branded like head to toe uh, uniform so what's your uh, take on that well, yeah, I mean, well, we, we, I think it's just for me, it's just you don't normally got you, you've got um, our team are fully employed. They we're, we're one brand, one team. Everyone work, we're, we're working as a team for Madison. So we're all fully branded. Yeah, everyone's got uniform. Um, we've played around with different types over time, but ultimately it's pretty simple. It's branded T-shirt, jumper, uh, pullover, sweatshirt, whatever. Um, look presentable. Sometimes people need reminded, but ultimately it's like we we want to be a top brand. So everyone should naturally when they when they when they come when they join the team they understand that we are high standards across the board. So part of that is how they present themselves, the trainers, all the way through to the, 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 the jumper it needs to be on point. And when you walk into either Studio One or Studio Two for PT or classes, the acoustics in uh, both of the gyms are to a high level. So uh, what did you take from your experience of uh, owning other gyms and, and what did you want when you started to build out Madison's in terms of that acoustics? So that, yeah, music, we, we felt music, for when we opened Madison's or when I was going through the concept, it was very important to have good sound. So we, I, I'd done the bootstrap stuff and like kind of put, put in random speakers and random corners and we, we wanted everything to be of a high standard. So we needed to invest in the best kit, um, to, to do that so I'd also bring in the right people to help advise I don't know anything about audio but I know what sounds good um, so I would just make we just made sure from day one it was done properly so we need music uh, especially with the large group training where it's a part of the workout it needs to be a good standard so that was taken into consideration very early doors we had people come in so um, a company comes in and does all the work for us ultimately but we music and being able to adjust the music throughout the session needs to be very easy and it needs to be of a high quality so that's what we've done and all the coaches in the classes are on a headset uh, versus uh, screaming and shouting uh, for the 45, 50 minutes. Again, what, what was the concept? Why, why did you decide to go down that route? I think with large, so with PT, much more intimate. We want people to be able to, they're working in very small groups of four. So it's, it's, it's small, it's, it's, it's quiet conversation sometimes. Sometimes you've got to raise your, kind of lift your voice, but often small, intimate conversations. And people need to feel comfortable with large group. We are you're, you're 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 instructing a room now. Any good coach who's moved progressively from one to one to small group, maybe to teach large group properly, it's a different type of skill set to manage a room. So communication is vital. You need to be very precise with your instructions. You need to be very clear, and obviously or, or, um, volume helps with that. So we decided because we have 
that room is ultimately its own room. We're not interrupting our PT. <clears throat> so we wanted to be as loud as possible. So we the, the kit we invested in, when you talk on the mic, it will drown down the music. So they kind of work in sync together. So we're not shouting over the music. That's also important because although they're mic'd up, it will turn, when they talk, it will bring the music down. They kind of work together. So it was very important because we need everyone to hear the coach. Also, our coaches are doing back-to-back -back large group sessions. So that gets quite taxing on the voice. We've had coaches do it without the mic for a few hours and they will lose their voice. Um, it's a lot of it's a lot of communication, a lot of shouting. For me, like so many gyms, like staff are turning up a few minutes before the session. They're not in uniform. The gym's dirty. Uh, the acoustics is like a Sonus speaker in the corner that is okay if, if you're working out in that corner, but if you're the other side of the room, you can't really hear it. Uh, the coach is like consistently shouting and then maybe they're on their fifth session of the day and their voice has gone and they're not com like they're not commanding the room. People aren't listening. And it's the little things that count, which then uh, means, you know, you can build a brand, you can charge premium and you can get people results, which is... Uh, you know, awesome for me to receive uh, as a as a customer of yours, and to also see uh, that happening as someone in the fitness industry. Yeah, I think you ha I think you have to be obsessed with. So, I think what will happen at all levels. So, whether you're if you come to Madison's, a lot of people will look at that and think, right, it's because it's a it's a it's done properly, right? <laughs> like this podcast studio. Um, it's done properly. However, no matter what stage you're at you need to take care of those, those details that are in your control. So you don't need a big fancy gym who, and you, you don't need all the fancy kit to do those things. So those should be their basics that you do at every level. So the turning up on time, dressing smart, the making sure you're prepared for members, that at any level. So if you're trying to get, if you're just trying to improve, right, you're a gym owner with a small facility, that stuff isn't, you have to do it. You, you have to do it because that matters at every stage. What happens is people get... Ultimately, it's gym owners or the leaders making excuses um, that their standards aren't high enough for themselves and the, therefore for the rest of the team. They need to they need to crack down on that early doors. So they might invest 20, 30, 40 K in kit and think that is the solution to building a good gym. But what you're saying is the small things. 100 percent. Like taking to like an, an example would be like a hotel. A hotel could you could have a beautiful hotel. You walk in. Rooms are amazing. Best beds, best linen. Um, the place is amazing. Great lighting great acoustics whatever but you but the team the team are all over the shop you walk in they're dressed terribly some of them wearing uniform some aren't they don't they don't say hey they don't say hi when you walk in that's not the experience you get at a good hotel if you go to any nice hotel often the best at service they they, they smash it from the minute you get in everything is on point um so it matters but even if you if you the yeah if even if you can't afford the best kit you should be doing this from day one. Make sure your team, if you have, first of all, you should have employed staff. If you have employed staff, the way they dress, the way they act, the way they talk and how, how they turn up is very important. They need to do that. You, you, they're, the, they're the basics. You just have to assume you're getting that bit right and then progress. Otherwise, you'll never get there because your standards aren't good enough. There will be many gym owners listening to this that uh, don't have employed staff. Can you just talk through the pros and cons of employed versus contractors? For sure. Well, I mean, from my perspective, we want to build something way bigger than uh, any any single person. So we need a team to do that. I be I believe we want people bought into the same mission. So for me, it just makes there is only one route. You want people bought in. They're all in to Madison's. We can. It's it's a it's a two way street. So we get everything from them, and we're going to give them everything. So for me, it just it's an absolute no brainer to have people fully employed. We just like any good business, you've got people have their. Their, their weekly schedule, we have meetings, we have, we, you're all bought into the mission. With with freelancers or self-employed, they're not fully in. So it's, it's, it's a completely different thing we're talking about. So I'm sure there's probably small group gym owners that have freelance trainers and they probably have a nightmare trying to have a meeting because it doesn't really work for either of them. They're expecting someone to come in uh, unpaid because they're not willing to pay them, but they're expecting them to be there. It's just never going to really work. For us, we have people bought into the mission uh, Madison's is way bigger than any of us, uh, but we're all giving it everything and then it gives us everything back. Plus pension, plus holiday, sick pay, uh, progression of their career as well. Um, and what we see like way too often is a gym will have contractors that have one foot in the gym owner's business, but then one foot in their own thing. And that could be online coaching. It could be a completely different career, uh, but normally it's their own personal training business, which they scale up to a level they keep growing growing and then before you know it you know they open up a gym around the corner or you know they 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 move out because their goal was to always build their their own business right not not partake in the mission of the bigger 
bigger business. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm all four people. Grow, I've had various conversations with someone's joined our team, both with Minka, the coffee, and the gym. People want, they, they've been open about wanting to do their own thing later, which is great. I, I'm fully support, supportive of that. So if I had a, a coach come and join us and they, they, they have this dream of opening a gym, and I see all the skill, the traits and skills that this is a good individual who's going to like put the work in. Whilst they're with us, they're all in. But they're going to. I think it's a win-win because I've got someone that's all in with Madison's. But they they are also if they truly do want to um, achieve that goal of opening their own thing one day, they are literally in the best uh, environment because they, I'm going to give them everything. Take what you want. Um, they will learn from a, some, another small business, and either they will learn a lot and re- open their eyes to that. I don't, I, that's actually not what I want because they realise how hard it is or they'll realise it is what they want and then great but while they're with us they are all in they're not doing something on the side and then a little bit of Madison's I need them to fully care about what we're doing and then later if they want to jump ship and do their own thing happy days um, you recently uh, hired a few coaches uh, can you just go through the recruitment uh, process that you have in place yeah cool so it's, it's been honest, up until now it's been quite it, it has been quite reactive like more reactive than we want but we so, so, in, and what I mean by that is the process of um, kind of like putting a job post out rather than actively recruiting like all year round, which is something we want to we want to work on. Uh, once we do have candidates coming in, so if we put like a job ad out, we often do get uh, a good buy on that. So, mem- uh, kind of applicants will apply for whatever the role is, and then from that, we have uh, Kate fully own that process. So we have some she'll respond to those. What, what's uh, her job role in the business? Kate is fully up. She's to be honest, from day one. She's just helped me with. Uh, anything so it was that person in the office who would be taking care of the in- inbox inquiries members like kind of emailing about the bits but also um any recruitment hr contracts things like that so anything i needed help with off the gym floor she's just been a saint there so planning events whatever it's, it's changed a little bit as we got bigger because we've had other people fill other roles but kate ultimately helps um a lot with the recruitment process so if someone at applies to work with us she would make sure all the initial communi- communication from emailing back and forth around their actual application booking an interview and then uh, I've passed that the all those stages over so I used to take care of a lot of that but all the any like kind of first interview second interview and so on will go through a couple of individuals on the team so either Tyler um, club manager or Jake depending on the person um, will those guys will have those kind of conversations and then we we just move, we often have one to three conversations if we like the person before uh, taking it to the next stage. But how, how it would work is someone applies for a job, we get back to them. If we think it's a, a good candidate, we just book a call with them before we have a meeting. And then there's various questions we'll ask in that, move on to in person uh, as soon as possible. What we found is some people, if they're local, we can get them in very quickly and that's our ideal. If they're further away, we might approach that differently. So that's why I said there might be like one to three calls because if they're quite distant, we may need that many kind of interview conversations before inviting them down. So once you've got a good candidate who uh, is showing all the right signs, um, they, they join the team and then what's the onboarding process to get them up to the level that you're happy with that they can go on the coach uh, on the floor and coach live? Cool. So we have actually something I'll skip there. So before even onboarding, what we'll do in the interview process, we what we like to do is meet. For me, it's really important. If someone's committing to a, a coaching role at Madison's, we know for the next few years, they're going to be an integral part of the team. So we want to make sure this person is absolutely right and we're right for them. So getting them into the club is super important. Whether someone's local or further afield, typically when someone's applied to work with us, all they know is what they see online. So they've seen social media, they've seen the website. They don't truly know Madison. So they might watch, again, watch our content, get to know the coaches, follow the coaches and kind of read our website, look at our app. But again, they don't truly understand. So I want them to come in and, and visit. That's my ideal because there's a big decision for them. It's a big decision for us. The person needs to be right. And I, I truly want them to, to love every day. So what we typically do is we invite that person in to the gym as quick as possible. Understandably, some p- people are already in. We got to be flexible with how we do this. However, we've done. I'll give some examples of how it's worked in the past. So, we, if someone's local and they have plenty of time available, we'll invite them in and say, right, for the next month, you can train as mad as much as you want. So, we get them signed up to the app, and we give them a full month of credits, whether it's small group, large group, or a combination, and we just let them let it be. So, we, ideally, what I want to see is that person train as often as possible. For me, it's sending loads of messages. If we give someone a month's access to Madison's and they only turn up once a week or not even, what does that say? Especially if they're close, if they're within driving distance or walking distance and they're not, they're not using it, that doesn't that doesn't look very good for me. So I'll give them full access to the app. 
it's a two-way street here as well. I want them to see and use the system so they can actually treat, like use it like a member and understand what we do fully. They know the schedule, they meet the coaches. And, the, and ideally, if someone's close, I want to see them training three times a week because they can under, truly understand. Ultimately, these are sessions they would be delivering. So if that was me, I'd be in as often as possible. But I want to understand the program, I want to understand everything. I'll be asking the coaches loads of questions. So we just give them access and let them do what they want. If someone's further afield, obviously we have to be a bit more like sensitive to that. So what I might do is try and get them in, but make the most of a single day. So if someone's quite far and they've got travel, in one like morning, maybe a, a Friday or a Saturday, whatever suits them, we will try and get them in so they can experience maybe a, a session, take part in a session, maybe shadow a session, and then we have some sort of like in-person interview. So we want to make sure that they can visit the club and get as, as much of a kind of uh, a feel for the place as, like in that short period of time so that for me is really important and we and we do some version of that for every person that applies we need them in the gym i need them experiencing the sessions and i need them seeing the sessions like without a doubt um that's just personally how we like it and then from there if we like a candidate and we're going to onboard them um we will go through depending on their experience level just assume we're talking about a junior they kind of slot in with our weekly CPD anyway, but what we'll do is, depending on their level of experience, we might f uh, fast track them. So they'll work one to one with Vincent. So just say we might think this person need in eight weeks. We want to take them from here, which might be they have some coaching experience, but they haven't coached in our environment. We don't think they're ready for small groups of two, three, or four yet. <clears throat> they can competently coach one to one. So what we do is we make an eight week plan where we don't do them any no large group yet. For the next eight weeks, they're going to do lots of uh, one-to-ones in week one and two. We then, when we decide it's ready, move them to one to two. Again, do lots of one-to-twos, eventually move them to one to three, one to four. So it depends on the person, but in an eight to 12-week period, we're going to get them doing as much PT as possible and then gradually build them up to bigger numbers. And then when they're confident, we then get them delivering a large group. It really depends on their experience prior, but that's kind of how we do it. In your whole time in industry and experience of running the businesses, um, has it always been that way? Or have you just slotted people in like quickly as possible? Like what are some of the mistakes that you've made around recruiting, hiring, onboarding? I think the, I think the biggest thing is <clears throat> not being really clear on like what we actually want in the first place because it's, like I said, it's a two way street. So we need it to be, we need the right person, but it also needs to be right for them. So we as a business need to take responsibility and make sure that we are delivering on our bit. <clears throat> but I think it starts being clear on like, who do we actually want? And we probably in the past have either rushed things and therefore by rushing, you get things wrong. So we've either hired the wrong people in a rush because we've needed the person to coach or we've needed the coach and we just we just needed them quickly. So we've kind of rushed that uh, and ultimately got the wrong person. And that could be um, we didn't ask the right questions. So the exp expectations were out. This person isn't prepared to coach the hours that we require or the hour, the, the kind of like times of the day, the mornings, the late, all that they kind of weren't built for that. But that's probably our fault for not explaining that thoroughly enough or you might bring someone in and the experience we actually we weren't giving them the development they required so we've kind of brought them in knowing their experience level and maybe didn't we weren't ready with the kind of development that we now have in place so therefore it took longer to get them prepared they might have coached sessions sooner than they should have which means a poorer member experience so we've probably got loads of things wrong but it probably comes down to our preparation and structure in the background which has led to that in the two and a half years that I've been a member of, of Madison's, I've never seen you coach a session. Um, so what is your role day in, day out? And why have you made that decision not to be on the floor? So, yeah, so I stopped coaching. 20, as soon as we opened the doors at Madison's, I made sure that I was not going to coach at all. So I wasn't in I wasn't in the business to coach. So and I wasn't in in Minka to do anything on the floor. So the idea was I had two basically had two new businesses starting. I knew that if I did a little bit, I could do more. So the idea was I need to remove myself completely so that I don't do any. My focus has changed a little bit. Where it is today is I focus purely mostly on growth, all things related to like us growing and that could be direct sales, new business, improving the product, anything I think is important to help us grow the business to more members and better revenue. And then also team. So thinking forward in terms of recruitment, team CPD, um, just bigger picture stuff. So how can we make sure we keep get the best people and keep the best people and then growth? So but for Madison's, I'm purely focused on that. And it's quite similar for Minka. So both businesses are pretty much around growth and team. Uh, my days, I'm very organized with what I want to get done. 
but the it will just vary obviously week to week. What would you say to the gym owner that's got one foot on the coaching floor still, one foot on the business, they have aspirations to leave the coaching floor, um, why should they do it sooner rather than later? I think you just can't you can't do both things well. I think you need it sooner for for me personally, and I think for a lot I wanted to build the best business possible, and it's in everyone's interest for me not to be on the floor. Like, I, I actually love it. If I uh, if I was to go and coach a session, it'd just be play time for me. I, I, it's just it's I enjoy that a lot. However, I should have probably stopped coaching truly to achieve the goals I want to achieve two or three years earlier at least, because I'm now free to f to think better, to focus on the tasks that actually step the business forward. Whereas I was, because I loved coaching, and which which is fine, I loved coaching, I, want, I was on the floor still coaching eight, nine hours a day, split days. So it meant other things are getting dropped. We didn't, we didn't pr make the progress the business should have made. And ultimately I'm letting everyone down by doing that. So as the leader, as the business owner, if, if you're gonna stay on the floor, you need who you need someone else to come in and take that role because if you're a bit, if you truly want to scale and grow, you need a business leader who is leading the business. If you're coaching, then either you you don't truly want to build that business or you need to get someone you you are, you need to take that role or get someone else in that role. It's never it's never going to grow. But I think that person is probably in their comfort zone, in their element and their their identity is I'm a coach. I'm I'm the PT. People come to my gym because of me and my personality and. What ends up happening is they stagnate financially, member growth, um, their impact in the industry because they're spinning all the plates in the business. Yeah, hundred percent. Probably, yeah, probably, maybe either, yeah, not realizing that it's it's, it's as important as it is. And I'd really urge someone if they truly want to build a business properly and they want to have a team that is um, bought in and developing and growing the best possible product, they need to get themselves off the floor. Or yeah, it could be a challenge because it's a, it's a new territory, right? They, what they know is coaching, they love coaching. But again, you've got to think of your team, your wider team and everyone involved. Like for me, I was letting everyone down by not stepping off the floor and taking the other positions because no one else is going to do it. So unless you are, uh, you've got two business partners, three business partners as a partnership and you take different roles, then that's different. But if you're a sole business owner and you are the coach and there is no one leading the business properly, truly, then it's going to be a problem. 400 plus members, um, what do you think capacity is? And let's switch up to sales and marketing. Capacity over five, so we, f true capacity, 550 plus. Um, we, that, that at the moment, like, again, there's so many, so much opportunity in the current schedule. So we do, we currently, yeah, over 525 members, but just to give it, in, if we break it down even further, we operate seven days a week. We currently don't coach on Friday evenings, Saturday evenings, or Sundays. We do a very short day on a Saturday and Sunday, and we only do six till two on a Friday. There's very various days where we could have four personal training sessions running, but we only have uh, three, and other times we only have two. So there's so much opportunity in that schedule to bulk it out. So it, we definitely, in terms of members, 550 monthly paying members, but actually we, we, at that point we could be servicing about 600 because the remainder would be on trials um, or on packages. Some of our large group members, um, so outside of large group members, some will buy packs of 10 or 20. Just for classes? Just for you classes. don't do that for PT? We don't do packages for PT. We want everyone on a monthly recurring training regularly. We, what we might find down further down the line Obviously, this is new territory for me. We'll have a big membership. So as we grow, just say from uh, 400 monthly members to 450 to 500, we might start needing to get start needing to do things we haven't done previously. So at the moment, we have various memberships, but we don't do things like off peak. Um, we don't do memberships for Saturday only. I've never done that before, but we might need to do that later. So maybe as we start to grow, there might be an opportunity to be smart with the memberships or maybe not. But I think further down the line, you may start to introduce things where we have maybe quieter hours. There might then be a need or we might fancy trying doing something where it is like, uh, here's a package just for these set sessions or these set times because it helps us kind of fill those hours, maybe. So when you do marketing, either digital, online, offline, what is the, typically the front end offer for people to get started? Large majority, so 90% of people that come through a trial with us is a personal training trial. So we advertise, our intro offer is a, and it has been for a long time, a 30 day personal training trial. We've played around with prices, it's gradually increased over time. So in our area, in, our, at our gym, for a uh, membership base we're at, we do a 30 day trial for 249 pound. What we've been trialing the last few months, so since, uh, so the last four or five months, we've been trialing that, so with 30 day 249. We then try and we encourage people to upgrade to a 60-day trial for 349. Um, we did it 
intentionally so that people would spend longer with us. We, we, I can't tr get the true results just yet because it's early doors, but we, most people start a 30-day trial, 249, and we try and encourage people or give them the option, or you can upgrade to 349 for 60, 60 days. The intention behind it is people train with us for longer, and hopefully we have more opportunity then to convert them into a membership. And for that, they get three PT sessions a week and access to classes. What's what do they receive? We promote it as two personal training sessions a week and a class a week. So two PT and one class. So whether it's 30 days or 60 days, two PT, one large group. However, we, we, what we, we're trained, either myself, if I'm on the phone or the other guys, we're trained to make sure when we speak to someone, we're, we're very aware that if we're speaking to a complete beginner and we think they're not suitable for large group, we may decide on the phone to upgrade them which is a nice added value for them to maybe do three PT a week and, and no large group for the first bit, just so we can embed them properly. Um, so it's sold as two plus one, but we obviously, we, we actually just, we're open about it. We'll say we'll, we'll, we'll adjust that depending on the person, just because we feel like, again, our goal is ultimately the conversion. So we're talking to a complete begin, beginner and we don't think they're going to use any large, uh, small group, uh, sorry, large group. We might upgrade them. Equally, if we're talking to someone that's like, I want to train five times a week, they've got an athletic background, we may add in some extra classes for them to get true value on that trial, but again, for the intention to increase the conversion on the other side. What is the sales process? Do you do a consultation? Is it a one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, is it a phone sale? Um, do you meet people uh, for a tour? What's the what's the process? Um, everyone pretty much signs up. So inquiry comes in, we book, have a book phone call. So either we'll call them off the cuff or uh, they eat, when they first inquire, they get an option to book a phone call so that often people will book a phone call. We have that call. We then speak to them through the trial in that, uh, sorry, speak them th uh, through the options and the trial offer. We often will gather as much information as possible so that we can sell sell them on the, on the spot on that phone call. So typically we will send them, we don't take a payment over the phone, but we'll sell them on that call. So they'll typically sign up while they're on the phone or afterwards via a link. From there, from trials, from the moment they've signed up, we book them in for a private one-to-one -one session. So that private session is a chance for us to understand exactly where they're at. So that will be a training session uh, 50 minutes. If they want to, we'll do an in-body as well. So if they're ha happy and open to that, we'll try and encourage them to do an in-body. But one-to-one, -one, private. They then go on to their small group sessions after that. And the team, whoever that runs that one-to-one, -one, will then feed back to the team to make sure that they're appropriately looked after. So even though they move to small group, we might decide to keep them in small groups of two if possible, or three if they're maybe really beginner. If we feel they're fine, maybe they, they we're happy to have them in groups of three or four, and then they just crack on with the trial. Uh, in terms of lead flow coming into the business, roughly sort of how many leads are you getting a month? Uh, and then what are you doing in terms of the sales follow-up with those leads? Is it like one call and then that's it? Are you persistent? Um, and who, who's selling in the team? So we have something, we, uh, as we we going into 2024, we wanted, we wanted to build, actually have a sales team. So going into uh, for 2023 on average, our leads per month were 85. So... It's about a 60 to 40 split between paid and organic. Um, but we that was for us, we looked at that good standard of leads because we have our trial um, pages will have the prices on it. We kind of, we did the maths and for us that uh, equated to the trial number that we needed. But we, we stepped things up going into 2024, we want to have 150 leads coming through. So we want, we want to up the game with paid and we want to up the game with organic. So we're kind of increasing the amount of leads we get per month uh, to ensure that we can hit our growth numbers. Um, with... Yeah, so 150 per month is the target currently. We actually missed it month one. January, we just got, got a bit complacent. Uh, sorry, January was fine. February, we got complacent, missed our target. So we, we, um, we've stepped it up now and we're, we're, we're smashing it again. But that is super important. And monitoring the numbers is vital because back in the day, I didn't do any of that. But monitoring that on a weekly, like daily and weekly, I'm always looking at leads. A give or take based off those 85 or the, the end target 150 leads, how many front end sales are you making uh, per month? So we get, so on the, that same data last year, so 85, 30 trials came through, 26 of them on average were paid. We often do some sort of comp, whether it's a family member. So last, so based on that 85, 30 trials a month across large group, small group. And then off the back of that, we, uh, conversion was about 85%. So off the back of a personal training trial, 85% of our members will then go into some form of membership. It could be PT or it could be large group. Um, and this year we're, we're aiming for, the kind of same the same results um so yeah what marketing sort of polls do you have right now uh, out in the water to to get people in so we pay, so paid 
ads will run daily, so across Meta. So we do kind of paid ads, small budget to that every month. Always works really well for us uh, in our area. Typically it has worked as long as we are feeding the right content in. So we're making sure we have a content, uh, someone come in, new fresh content, video and pictures uh, every month. So that uh, takes up the majority. And then organic, we're trying to step the game up. So whether it's uh, such a general kind of social post and engagement on social media, we're trying to increase that. Uh, and then Run Club is a big one. So recently this year, our strategy is building the Run Club both in our local area, Hayward's Heath, and then about 20 minutes out in Brighton, we're trying to build the Run Club as an organic way to kind of br bring more eyes on the brand, both for new members and new staff members. Outside of that, that's kind of currently, currently what we're, we're, we're doing, uh, and that's, that is that is it. But we are planning to do um, some other things in the next coming months, so flyers and some old school things like that. We'll switch to the coffee shop in a bit, but how many people are coming into the coffee shop um, as brand new customers to the coffee shop and then buy fitness from you and they weren't a fitness buyer previously? Is there a cross, crossover? Definitely a crossover. I'll be making up, I don't know the number, so I'll be making it up, but I know from Reg, so, so we have definitely had people come to Minka, spend some time there over weeks and months and then eventually like show interest in Madison's. Um, so people have definitely joined from like spending time in Madis uh, Minka and then joining the gym. And we've definitely had the comment various times where they've noticed because they see people in Minka will see people coming out of the gym, socialising afterwards. They're kind of like curious to what's going on. Uh, but we haven't fully capitalised yet on actually like promoting well enough in Minka yet because there's actually a, there's an incredible amount of people that come through there every day. Um, I don't know the exact amount of people that travel through, but we have around 300 like transactions every day. So that, there's more people than that in there. Um, but that's how many, there's, there's, it's a big volume, it's a high volume coffee shop. So there's a lot of people coming through and majority of people coming through Minka are non-members. We have a lot of our members coming into Minka, but they make up a small portion of our Minka customers. So there's huge potential, but we've not really tapped into it yet. Um, we're going to go back to sales. Um, so as these inquiries are coming in, um, how long are you spending on the phone with them? Uh, are you facing any objections? How are you overcoming those objections? Yeah, cool. So typically, set out what we call is like discovery calls, sales calls. They'll typically be 10 to 20 minutes. We have a series of questions. We, we start the call. We want to own that phone call and ask various questions that allow us then to like manage that call. So we try and find out all the important stuff for us, experience, times they want to train, uh, how often they can train, the goal, really important. But we try and we, we, we take control as soon as we pick up the phone, find out all the info we need, and then we can direct them from there. 10 to 20 minutes, is th that's it. And then um, from there, the call's done. We should know by the end of that. We, we've heard, so objections, typically, um, objections normally would come down to someone tr time, time and price. It's usually pretty good to be honest. It's in, over time where we're at now, we don't get that off that often. Um, because why, I why do you think that is? I think we intend. I think people. I, I think a lot of people, even though they're booking a phone call and not coming like through the referral route, they've often been recommended, or they've watched us for a while. They've seen the price. They're probably they've seen the trial price. They can see some, our large group. Although we don't display our PT prices on the website, our large group prices are there. So I think they potentially have some sort of understanding. Also, the type of clientele we're, we are targeting, I think they have got an understanding of some of the costs. So I think they're kind of coming in kind of aware of that. And we do put that trial price on the landing page. They understand you're not a 20 quid low cost gym. Yeah. I think they're very aware, again, because of the content, the ads, what they're seeing, they're very aware that they've got to pay some something. Also, because you built the brand to a certain level yeah. that they're sort of pre-sold or they know someone that trains there. They've heard good things, good reputation in the area. And, you know, when they decide to knock on the door, it's so easy to just open it and for them to walk in yeah. because of all the hard work that you've done over the, the years to build the brand. 100%. We're trying to, and we're, we're constantly thinking of ways to like lower the, so we obviously need to be aware that we want the, we, we, we want the right people to get in touch because we are a premium. We're not a 20 pound a month gym, but sometimes people need to see the value. So we are very aware that we need people that are willing to invest in their health at the prices that we charge. However, sometimes people truly just need to see what we do and then they realize they love it. An example of this would be sometimes people we talk to and they're, they're adamant they won't pay for or, or afford or they won't invest in personal training. So we just get them in large group and we get them to try it. And then once they start training, they get a taste for it. And then actually then they do end up trying a small group and then they end up paying for small group. So we've had people move from large group training who were adamant that, we've even had people that have complained about the price with large group but then they've ended up spending 
up with £150 more per month. We literally had someone that upgraded into a small group who had previously complained about the large group prices, but they're now paying £150 more per month for this. Um, but again, I guess it's a value thing, right? They value, Once they experienced it, they valued it. Maybe they didn't value that initially enough, but then they did. Let's go back to marketing. You talked about Run Club. Uh, what is it? Can you go into detail on it? Yeah, sure. So Run Club, um, we started this year. So we've, we're about six or seven runs in, in Hayward's Heath. We, we're just basically capitalising on opportunity. For me, Run Club, running running seems to be picking up massively. So don't know the true reasons. High Rocks might have something to do with it. It's just at a stage where I feel like it's growing and growing and growing. There's some great clubs across the country. And we feel, I personally want to be the player in Hayward's Heath. From my perspective, it's always been like an old person's thing. It's not been that exciting to get involved with, personally. But we wanted to be the place that like, if there's local residents that kind of see, maybe they see a run club in London because they work in London and think, oh, I wish there was something like locally. I, we want to be that brand. We want to be the people. But we also, I'm very aware that not everyone can afford to train at Madison's. It's, it's a fact. But can we do something that's free for people to come along to? They can have a taste of what it's like to be a part of the Madison's community. Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do. So come, come have a try of Madison's. So if you're not a member, it's a great way to come and taste Madison's, get to meet the people, the trainers, the coaches, uh, and the members for nothing, free of charge. If you're a member, it's a great added value. Come and spend more time with the community. It's something. Uh, it's another free session on top of your training. And some people want to, like, they want to get into running, but they don't want to do it solo. Uh, it was raining today. We all ran. There's about 35 of us running. A lot of people wouldn't have done that if they're on their own at all. Yeah, definitely yeah. not. <laughs> so, like, so we, if we can do, if we can be like, we again, community is such a big part, and, uh, and like. Um, one of the phrases I use with the team a lot is dominate the postcode. So as a brand, we want to dominate the postcode. And uh, adding a run club is part, part of that mission. So for us to have a run club, at the moment it's one day a week. We want to see how big that grows, especially as we head into summer, and we'll add other days. We have the luxury of using Minka, and that was the intention when we opened Minka, to have it as an event space. So we can have our own space. We haven't got to negotiate with anyone to use a space. Um, a, a start and finish point. It's obviously great brand, like great great brand recognition for Minka as well. So everyone starts and finishes there, they have a coffee, they socialise. But more importantly, we have a, a space of our own to meet before the run and finish, right? Um, so we want to, the Hayward Heath, we want to grow. Also, we're very aware that it's a good way to get people in at a very low level. So like people, we've had typically four or five new faces every run, every week. And therefore what we do is up to us. But what we, how we see that is if someone, four or five new faces come into Minka and Madison's, they're now into our like, ecosystem. So whether we offer them a free coffee or we offer them a free class is up to us, right? But me personally, what we want to try and do is get them to have a taste of Madison's sessions. Like you've enjoyed the run club, you enjoy what we're doing. Can we get them in to maybe try three classes? I personally would offer people some free sessions. So maybe th three class credits. Come and try it out, see how you get on. Because if we offer that to 50 people, even if 10 of them take us up on it, I think that's a win. And if they don't st stick to it, but they still keep coming to Run Club, that's a win. They might tell a friend. So we want to get as many people through the kind of like Minka and Madison's ecosystem because we think we've got something great. We love the community. We do truly think like everyone in here is here should come and have a try. And then if they decide to continue, great. If they don't, no problem. And you get 35 people on a wet uh, March, Friday, so fast forward a few months when it's sunny, you know, that'd be hitting 50, 75, 100 people. I think so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Definitely in Hayward Heath and obviously Brighton, we can take it even bigger. So we'll see. Yeah, but it, we, we want a big turnout for that. It's a, and it's a priority for this year because, again, also recruitment reasons. Like we think the brand is spread, just run clubs can spread so fast. Uh, people just need to bring one friend the next time and they'll, they'll, they'll just it will just get legs and grow real quick. So, yeah, we're keen, keen to push it. So recently with your organic marketing and Instagram, you did a contest. Can you just go into detail on that? Yeah, sure. So we did. So we've done. Uh, we've done it for the last couple of years. We did. A f we give away a full year of training. So we give you a full year of uh, training at Madison's, include some PT, include some large. For group. one person. For one person. Yeah. So we're going to give away a full year of membership and a hundred pound voucher at Minka. So the idea is we want lots of local. So the 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 goal for me was to get the, the Madison's shared locally. Um, and lots of new emails. So what we did, we put a post out and said, right, if you um, put your de like basically like both pages and give us your name, email. We we'll flash it up on YouTube so people can see it. Right. So yeah, name, email, number. We ended up getting just under 600 uh, email addresses. Of that, about 380 were not known to us. They hadn't previously got in touch. They weren't a current member. They weren't a trial list. Then of that 380, what we did was we took that uh, list. And so first of all, a winner was picked randomly. So we, we picked a winner. 
they won a year of training. Um, we then thought, right, well, let's max, we want to maximize this. So the, our, our goal as a business was like, let's get new people, new contact details, new leads, uh, but also some sort of virality. So that post got shared a bunch of times. Lots of people would have seen it. And that might have been the first time they've seen Madison's or the 10th time they've seen Madison's, whatever. So nice reminder in the feed. But more importantly was those email addresses. So luckily, we got 380 new emails. What we did, about a week later, we emailed all those people and said, um, you didn't win the main prize, but we got something for you. It's coming in a couple of days. We then emailed all those people. And what we did was we said, you've got, uh, for 50 people only, we're going to give you three credits. All you need to do is download the app. And here's a coupon. So we people at, it actually went way quicker. I first was, come, first served. First come, first served. Download the app and the re, the coupon's ready. So like you download the app and you'll see it sitting there. We just explained how to find this it. This was classes, large group only. Yeah, yeah. So not no PT. We 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 me made a decision, low barrier. So even if there's people going to sign up, we think they are more like suitable for people. We just need them in our ecosystem. Like let's just get them on the app. We get them down to the app. They can then see our sessions, see what we have to offer. And the ones that are really keen will obviously book those sessions. And what we said was we're going to give away three credits and they have a 10-day expiry. We wanted people to come in and use their free credits quickly so that we can get them into a routine. And then off the back of that, they're going to have our usual trial offers. Um, we actually had someone within the first few days, he did his first class and he spoke to us about, he bought the 60-day trial. So before he even finished his three passes, he bought, bought a trial. So that was a winner ready. But what we wanted to do was let's just get people in when people start downloading the app and um, purchasing, the, so getting their credits for free, we want to speak to all of them. So we had Jake on the phone. He scheduled calls with the majority as soon as possible because we still wanted to find out who they were, what they've done before, what's their experience level. Because we knew that some of these people may not be best suited to a large group, but let's try and find out and at least give feedback to the coach so we're prepared. We need to give those people the best possible service, even though it's free, because we want to like intentionally move them into like some sort of trial. But even if those people try us out, we might invite them to come along to Run Club, they come along to Minka. There was like various different wins. Our biggest win was trial and ideally a membership, but we understand a lot of those people might just, a win is just come to Minka or come to Run Club. So that one post organically has been shared many times, uh, 600 plus contact details. And then from that, lots of people experiencing the brand and new sales made uh, from a very a low budget, uh, shoestring budget uh, marketing tactic. Um, and you're going to roll it out again? For sure, yeah. So we'll, we'll not only we'll repeat, obviously we'll do the, the whole kind of campaign again. <clears throat> Ideally, a year from now, if we want to do it before then, we might do it before then. But ultimately, because 50 people took that offer very quickly, we've now got, we've still got another 300 plus to email. So we could do it again. So what we thought was, I actually thought they would, uh, that would come in slower. So we thought we we're going to have to remind them of the offer a couple more times for us to fill the 50 spaces. But obviously they went in day one. So what we'll do now is we want to get through those 50 members, so service them in the next 10, 20 days, and then we'll, re we'll email the other 250, same offer, first 50, come in, and then repeat. So we'll probably just, we might do that two or three times. I've not done this before, so we'll see. But if we we just, we'll just like try it, measure the results, do it again, get through those 300 contacts, and then and then see how it works out. Um, but we, it, so far, so good. So... We just need to. We just need a lot of contact because ultimately, there's a lot of free people we're servicing. Uh, but so far, I said it's worked well. So, let's switch to Minka. Why didn't you put another gym or um, build a bigger gym in the Minka space? Why did you decide to go with a coffee shop? So, a few reasons. One, initially, when we looked at it, so the <clears throat> Minka only exists because of Madison. So we wanted. So like, I wanted to build a new concept for Hayward Teeth, and part of that was all round great experience I wanted a smoothie bar as soon as you walk in a smoothie bar at reception so smoothies, coffees very small though it's going to be tiny um, smaller than the studio right small um, small setup and then as the project got bigger um, we realised that actually look we're going to have a very small coffee shop and it's not going to be that great so it was almost by accident but I, I didn't want it to be branded Madison's because I thought it would be off-putting for like non-fitness people so that we branded it differently, but eventually, initially, it was going to be a very small part of the gym entrance. Um, on the on the go, we decided to make it bigger and bigger. So where Minka currently is, it was actually going to be half um, like coffee bar, and then half changing rooms. But again, we looked and we thought right, this is not going to be a great coffee shop. It's not going to be a great changing area. So, but this is all on the fly. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that when I was planning Madison's and Minka, I literally had from from it being a from it being an idea like from it actually being an opportunity so once the space was available me finding out like this is a space is here i was i had a 6 month time frame to go from idea 
bear in mind, no branding, no website, nothing. So we got to open the doors because the opportunity for this new space was happening. I think throughout COVID, obviously the the the, the building was going to be for court, like for offices, and then that that the, the need and demand. For Just that to give context, uh, this building was being built for residential flats yep. above, and then the retail space was down below. And the building work, from memory, was happening in COVID, yep. but it stopped start. And I actually remember, so FMA's office, original office, was in a co-working space, and then you would um, be in that co-working space as well. And I remember in COVID, like, popping in and out of the office, you know, on a Saturday afternoon at 4, or sometimes I forget something and I have to go back at, like, Tuesday at 10 p.m. at night, and all the lights would be on. I'm like, who's in the office, this co-working space at this time? Go in, it's you, you and your dog, yeah. uh, George. And, and that's what you were working on consistently in that short time period, right, um, was the concept of everything that's built right now. 100%. Yeah, it was so it was November uh, 2020. So bear in mind that, that year was a chaos with like COVID. So November 2020, the, I, the opportunity for this build. So I've seen this building being built. I've never ever paid attention to it. We actually promoted on the boards at the front. Like I didn't, I, I just saw a residential building going up. I think they had planned to put offices in the bottom. So I never considered moving there. Great location, but never considered it. It wasn't even either. So November 2020, I get told that actually, look, there's space here. Do you want to build something in it? So the opportunity is like, right, I'm like, when's it When's it going to be ready? June 21. Yeah, six months later. So it's like, right, this is the idea. I'm like, like okay, right, should let's get to work. So the initial building we're looking at, we're not currently in it. There was one of the other blocks, so where Majestic Wines is. So the opportunity to move into this space you can do it, but you've got to be, I needed to be ready in six months. We looked at that space and basically ceilings were too low. It wasn't gonna work. So like, that one, then then basically we changed plans. So, so it's now not gonna be that space. It's gonna be um, another unit. So just around the corner. That will be ready like three or four months later. So you still only got like nine months to get this done. And I'm talking, it's just an idea on paper at the moment. There is no brand. There is no, there is no, I'm gonna do a large group concept that we've not done. Have before. you worked in a coffee shop? Any coffee no. shop experience? Nothing, no coffee shop experience. However, it gets, again, at the point, this is going to be a small coffee bar, part of the gym. We're working on the fly. So as this is like, we now got to get to, we've got to start working, speaking to everyone. <laughs> this is, then neither business exists and we've got a nine month time frame. So a lot of things were changing on the, on the go. Also, because we're in and out of lockdown. So this is like end of 2020, going into 2020, we were stop and start with things. Um, so... I couldn't even go and see, so with the, the new concept, I love to go, so with coffee, although I've never worked in a coffee shop, I love experience. So I love going to good restaurants, good hotels where I'm looked after. It can be, it can be, it doesn't have to be fancy. It's just like your good service, right? But so I was building Minka as a customer. I was like, where, what, what do I love about good coffee shops? And I, I know based on all my experience running a gym, we can deliver great experience. I want to know everyone's name. We need to remember their orders. We need to make sure they're looked after. If they, If a woman walks in with a pram, find a space for them to sit. For me, it's just common. It's just like good service. I'm n I know we're going to have good coffee because I'm going to get the best coffee beans, the best milk, and I'm going to get the best baristas, best in class pastries, everything. But in service is going to be the reason people come back. So I knew, I've got that experience. I don't need to work in a, in a coffee shop to have that. Like I've got that. We're going to do that. But we had this nine month time frame. So uh, things were just getting built on the go. So my point there was going to be, I couldn't even go to, um, for me, I wanted to go to like London gyms and experience the classes because this idea just started to happen. I couldn't even visit them because they were shut. So I couldn't go to like your best large group gyms and see what they did well. So we're trying to build like, I was now starting to recruit coaches, building the concept in my head. I need to sell the, the dream to the new coaches, but I'm not really sure what it is yet. And we, we can't even test it. Um, so we did as much as we could in our first gym, in the small group gym. But um, it was it was an intense period. So like nine months from idea to actually opening the doors was the kind of time frame we had. For everyone watching, we'll flash up video footage of Minka Coffee Shop. Um, but just go through uh, how big is the team? What's the service offering uh, on the menu? So team, because so with the coffee uh, industry, we have a combination of full time staff and we have some zero hours. So full time are kind of like your they're, they're like our uh, version of coaches in the coffee world. So the baristas that are taking their kind of career in coffee seriously. So they are the core part of our team. Um, and then and we have four to six. No, five to seven like full-time baristas and and then and we're a seven day business so seven days a week very busy the rest of zero hours are made up of people that are kind of up up for that kind of role so typically the classes are, are runners and they will be those that maybe have finished uni in between jobs great great people great with service uh, but they're kind of finding their thing so 
Um, on any one day, we could have anywhere between five to seven full t- like staff on for the shift to give a context. So busy coffee shop, um, but yeah, a combination of full time staff and, and kind of zeroed hours uh, team members. And that's a, yeah, that's the team. Uh, what's on the menu? So co- main, so we don't do breakfast, but other, other than that, everything up until breakfast. So you've got all your hot drink, coffees, best coffee around. Um, we have pa- all the pastries, brownies, toast sandwiches and uh, smoothies. So a big part of our, our core offering are the coffees, the smoothies and then the toast sandwiches, everything we make in, in-house. And where did you go and find all of this? Like you had no contacts in the industry. How did you like assemble everything? So for me... I, I will um, look at my fa- where, where was I going so my favourites in the in the area so I might think right where, where do I spend my time so which coffee shops are my favourite in Brighton in London what can I learn so if I can what I'll do is go I spend a lot of time in coffee shops watching how they're doing things so uh, and then and then from there dig deeper so who, if I love the pastries at this coffee shop well, I think our guests will love the pastries like who are they using What's who's the supplier where are they getting baked uh, coffee as well so where, where where is the roaster where is our best roaster locally that I can work with uh, and then from there, you just dig deeper and deeper, the best milk, all that kind of stuff. So for me, I want to find best in class of all the kind of like components and then bring them in. But it's just spending time for me. Like I said, I built it as a customer. So um, I just sat in coffee shops a lot and then thought about what I wanted. And then with the team in Minka and then the team in Madison's, do you ever integrate them? We definitely integrate. We, we want to do a better job of that. So what we found, we're very big uh, because with Madison's, uh, the way that we, we can like stop for meetings with the kind of hospitality industry and coffee. We can't do we can't like stop in the middle of the day and have a meeting. So the, we're trying to work on how to bring the team better. Also, we have a combination of full time, part time. So we definitely bring the team together, but not as much as I'd like just yet. So I think we definitely because we're so big on socials for Madison's, we try and invite the Minka team. So any time we do a, a, like a member social for Madison's, we would like to see the Minka team come along. But we're trying to battle a lot of them because they don't. Um, it's like kind of this nervousness around like oh, I won't know anyone. So we're trying to like get them more involved and also do more things just as, as an isolated team, which would be quite good. The social elements, a lot of it is held in Minka. Can you just uh, go through sort of what you've done in the past and what's coming up? Uh, so it's, these are socials for the gym. Yeah. So um, socials for the gym that we run in Minka. So we do a, a popular event called Friday Night Lights. So we'll do a session in Madison's on a Friday, 6 p.m. Big, big workout, big group session. And then we work and then we go into Minka 7 p.m. onwards. We typically we want it to be like a casual house setting kind of envi- like vibe. So we will work with a local food service of some form so this uh, recently has been beer and wings so we would work with Lockhart local business that do incredible like Korean wings we put uh, beers and wings on for everyone so like I said house party vibes you just help yourself everyone's mingling and chatting so Friday Night Lights is one of our most popular we'll have 40 plus for the workout and then we'll have in total um, anywhere from 60 to 70 for the for the full event in, in the social so we do two or three of them a year and then in Minka outside of that we've got Christmas party Halloween party um, we've done some a dinner supper club, and up, we've got another one coming up, which we haven't done before yet, is a quiz night. So uh, we just try and use the space as, as, as much as possible, and it is a yeah, it's great. So there's many gym owners listening to this right now that have installed a coffee machine in their gym, or they've like built out an area inside of their gym that is like a lounge area for coffee. Uh, there's some maybe listening to this that have coffee shops like yours. Uh, why would you encourage it? What are the pros? What are the cons? Yeah, cool. So without knowing like someone's full, first of all, their business and their goals, it's hard to advise. But I know from my personal uh, that kind of stance and opinion where I'm at, Minka for us is a standalone standalone business. So in that kind of like crazy period of like designing Minka, I knew I wanted it to be separate from Madison's because it was just an opportunity that I had to jump on. I knew it was going to be a wild ride. Um, it was very distracting running two businesses at the same time. So there are definitely some cons I'll, I'll come back to. But with Minka, for me, I want, wanted them to be separate. It's really important that we weren't relying on a fit. It's not a fitness cafe. So we want people that train at the gym to come in and use it. But it's ultimately built for non-members as well. Minka could stand alone in anywhere. We could take that, put it in Brighton, and I'm sure it would do really well. We could take it and put it next to someone else's gym, and I'm sure it would do really well. right? But Minka had to be a separate entity, and we treat it that way. So... Um, we uh, from day one separated the two things. So my experience is I haven't got experience having a coffee shop as part of our gym or in the reception area or uh, in the front of house area, like a smoothie bar. Ours is a standalone thing, which means like we are very busy as a coffee shop and that might have something to do with it because it's a separate brand, a separate thing. It, it, it's busy. Now, 
there might be a gym owner who has decided to maybe start a smoothie bar or coffee shop as part of their gym and it's not taken off that well. And maybe that's why. Maybe because it is, maybe maybe you you have got a limited traction if you are within a gym. I don't know. I've got, I know people that have got a coffee bar or smoothie bar within their gym and it's not doing as well as they thought it would. And maybe it's because it is in the gym. However, maybe you're not doing enough to get it busy either. If it is like a little side side thing, are you doing enough to get people in? And um, what do you want from it? Is it just a nice added value where you're doing a few products and, and it's just a few, like, I don't know, you want your members to buy smoothies. What is the goal of it? I'd say that's really important. So what is the goal? Why does it exist? What are you trying to do? If you're trying to make serious revenue, you probably need to take it seriously. And take it out of the gym. Take it out of the gym. But even if it's in the gym, I'm sure there's, there's brands in London that I know will be, they probably take good, I, I, I can't say for sure, but just bougie uh, large group facilities and, and class gyms in London. And the smoothie offering is a big part, but they have pre-order ability um, so people have their smoothies ready. Go to a, go to a, go to like a Barry's in London, right? You're going to go in. Smoothies are an integral part of the entrance area. You can pre-order when you go in. Very easy. Great because they've got their members on the system. They can charge them automatically and the smoothie's ready when they leave. So if you have got a smoothie bar or coffee shop within your gym, are you doing enough to maximise the opportunity? Or are you coaching on the gym floor, then rushing over and doing smoothies in the 15-minute break before the next class and you're trying to spin all these plates success leaves clues right go to someone that's smashing it just go and watch go and pay if, if you've done if you've um this this bothers me right if you have done that you've built a uh, coffee bar smoothie bar within your gym and you haven't been to ones that are doing well or have been doing it for 10 years why like go and pay, go to do a class in london where they've they've probably on, they're on scale they have multiple sites they obviously know what they're doing to test it go and pay for a credit do a class order a smoothie like if you haven't done that that baffles me and um, the amount of coffees i've purchased from other coffee shops or sat in coffee shops just to build that bear in mind i've never run a coffee shop or owned one it, it, it's tons i do and i still do it i was in dublin just gone the weekend i spent my time i went to four different coffee shops and i took notes in every single one so if you opened if you have got that and it's not doing as well as you you want it to like you got a question yourself but if you're thinking of doing it, truly, you need to have a, I think you need to kind of think it through because I think it might look good, but it takes a lot of work to get it right. What are your stress levels like trying to manage both of these taking off at the same time? They're, they're good now. The first year was, it wasn't good. Like the first year was horrendous. I wasn't training. I wasn't like looking after myself for sure. But I ultimately, again, on paper, I had two new business. Well, I was running one business, which was coming out of COVID. So it had its own stresses, like, um, and then starting two new businesses from scratch. Definitely do not recommend it. And it was very distracting because ultimately I I just jumped on an opportunity. And I, for me personally, I knew the less what I'm going to learn in the next year, two years, three years as a business owner, which will uh, kind of like serve me long term. I, I kind of did it for that reason. But having the coffee shop, which is its own entity with big revenue and, and, and a lot of problems, it was very distracting for year one. So it's it was probably, it's not ideal, but I've got through it. So the first year was very intense. I've got, two, like I said, two new models working. I have no idea with just, the, again, perspective. Never run a large group only with Madison's. We'd figure out a new uh, product, new members, new area, new price points. Like the first year is hectic. With Minka, never order stock. You've got order stock. You've got waste. You've got staff levels. You, who knows? The tra- it's, it's not. It's, it's a new business. So we had to figure that out. So two businesses at the same time, yeah, do not recommend it. Very, very well, strong. It takes a certain caliber of person who's like dedicated to their craft of entrepreneurship and business to jump into footed like you did. So like hats off to what you've achieved and, and doing that and spinning those plates at the same time and, and getting it to the level it's at. It's, uh, it's amazing uh, and, and admirable to many listening and watching this. Um, and there's been so many FMA clients that come to uh, FMA HQ uh, for trainings or, or meeting or podcasts and then they experience uh, what you've built next door. And yeah, everyone's like you know, positive and the, the vibe and you only hear good things uh, from, from the Minka and the Madison's brand. Um, so it's testament to, to yourself. Let's go way back. When did you enter the fitness industry? What was your early years and what did you build initially? So, so, two, so I entered the industry about 18. So I finished college. Wasn't going to go to, for me, it wasn't going to go to uni. Entered, yeah, entered the industry about 18, got qualified. From there, I was very adamant for, for, for whatever reason, early doors. So this would be about 2010. Um, I I followed, I, I was always in, if, if I was studying for my own growth, I loved it. 
um, so I wanted to be the very best in the area at the time. I was doing one to one boot camp, outdoor boot camp first. Use a local school, so outdoor boot camp. We were like, I was rolling. Uh, if anyone, well, yeah. Anyway, local school. I was rolling these tractor tires. Honestly, my, my parents' house was like a five minute walk from the field, and you're, you're like, rolling tractor tires down the road. Yeah, two, two, one at a time. Yeah, so like a huge, like big tractor tires. So we'd take. I started a little boot camp outdoor like kind of we called it urban training it was outdoors on a saturday load of lads from the gym um like five fiver like nothing we at the time facebook was if you tag if you tag people everyone saw it it was like early door it was like early like i said it was 2010 ish so um that was quite cool because we'd post pictures every week i did like an album we'd had like 30 photos from each session but anyway we'd roll these tires i'd roll through bono like five minutes with the tractor tire, go back and get the other one, roll it there. Then we had, and then in the car, um, kettlebells, hammers, ropes, all that kind of stuff. All stored in your parents' garage. Yeah, all stored in the parents' garage. Um, did that, pads, like all that good stuff. Just to get, and it, it, was, it was fun. So I did that on Saturdays. So at 18 years old, I basically started boot camp. I then started doing PT in the gyms, um, at like a local leisure centre. Then... There was another local gym opening and I had the opportunity to move from the leisure centre to the gym and pay a rent. So this is my first proper experience in one-to-one -one coaching. And I was committed to learn. I wanted to be the very best. And at the time, it was all about kind of like physique transformation. So I was committed to doing, like taking people through a, a proper kind of change. And because I could work one-to-one, -one, I felt I, I was so passionate about everyone's like result. So I'm going to get them an incredible result in a 12 to 16 week period with the intention that they stay with me all year. But I would work, I, the, the, the names I could list, I would, I was paying for 18 years old, 19 years old, paying 150, but anywhere from 100 to 150 pounds an hour to work with various different mentors. Not like you, not, not like you find mentors now. I sought them out. They were, they were like great coaches at other gyms. Um, running gyms, so a couple either in the States or in the UK, and I wanted to just know how they were doing it. So they were, they were miles and miles away. I'd Skype at the time, get on Skype, pay whatever they wanted for an hour, pick their brains on nutrition, on training, on programming, anything. Off the back of that, I'd learn a ton and then either um, pay for another course or meet another guy. It's like you said, success leaves clues. So the, the habits you have now with the coffee shops you were doing back then as an 18-year-old PT. Yeah, so... 100%. So does the, yeah, and it was whether it was Mark Coles who had a gym, M10 in Nottingham, or it was uh, people in a similar uh, kind of like boat to that. At the time, because I wanted to, uh, long term, wanted the one to one facility, I wanted to learn everything about one to one coaching. So I wanted to be, I want, I thought I had this dream of like at some point we'll open a private gym. So I want to find out who's doing, who's the best. Uh, there was various gyms in, in London. And, and further afield that we're doing one to one in a, in a great way. I thought like I want to learn. They've got teams. I want to learn everything. How how are they doing that? And with nutrition, it might be a nutritionist in the states. I want to learn around female fat loss. Like tell like tell me everything. There was obviously other courses started to emerge, but I want I personally learned well just like speak to someone, one to one, and and I'd learn a certain topic. So I, that would then filter for five years. So like 2010, 2011 through to 2015. 15 it was just all one-to-one -one coaching paying a local um gym and then we opened the site on borough road which is 2015 opened um a, a big location there and that's when we started the small group training so you're pt in one-on-one -on -one, and then you decided to open the gym yeah so pt in one-to-one -one, at the time we i was paying rent had a couple of friends locally as well good 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 guys good coaches we formed the brand so performance project became a brand so we i, I was like work on my own so that two other coaches but why are we paying rent um like multiple of us paying rent at multiple different places all coaching uh all believe in the same thing of value in terms of like results want the best for members if um but all very young as well so like with our, uh, we formed this business called performance project one focused on one-to-one -one, and even some online at that time as well um so we formed performance project this space becomes available in 2015 a uh, big space we're talking 4,000 square foot, like across two floors. Probably silly, but you're, you're naive, young, just go for it. So it was pretty much initially, it's, it's, it's a big room with squat racks. It wasn't anything like you see today. It was bootstrap, just, just get, get the doors open. We start with one-to-one -one on the ground floor. Big space upstairs. Don't know what we're going to do with it yet. But event, the reason I'm saying that is important is because eventually that turns into small group PT. So we're now at 2015. Um... We think right what, what we're going to do about this 
with this like group training thing. And my brain, how it normally works, would be like, who's doing it the best? Who exists? I don't. Initially, I didn't like the idea of small group training because my my um, view on it or my experience of it was poorly, poorly like poor small group training, right? So then I found who was doing it really well. Um, Me like a leisure center, like exercise to music class, or like a body pump, or just someone. The people that were doing small group, it was just like pretty poor. Yeah, I think small group, had, had, not even those ones, I, w- I wouldn't even put that in the same category. It's like small group PT for me was like, at the t- even if groups of six, like proper, because stri- we came from like proper one-to-one strength training, people that were delivering groups of six, it would just set up like circuit training. So it wasn't the group class thing. It was just this random mashup of people attempting to do strength training, but in a really poor way. So I thought, I don't, I don't see people getting results from that. I don't believe in that. So... I want to find out who is doing it well and then set myself the challenge of, right, if we're going to commit to this, I want to do it really well. So how, what do we need to do? So then we start to, again, do the homework, go and find out who's doing it well, spend time with those people. So big props. So you've had JC on the podcast previously. JC and W10, what they were doing at the time, he was someone I reached out very, very early um, and went and watched what they were doing, learned as much as I could, just be a sponge, take what they're doing. They were a few years ahead of us. They've been, they've made a lot of mistakes. They had had a lot of lessons, take exactly what's working, put it into our gym. And then we figured out as we went. So from 2015 to 2020, ultimately small group became our priority. So we now spent five years doing small group training, all the ugly stuff in between learning how to do like full time, like employ full time staff, made the mistake of having freelancers move from, freelance into full time, figured out the certain timetable, figured out the programming. It was a it was a long experience. Got to 2020, lockdown hits. At this period, uh, there was a lot of lessons to learn very quickly. So as the, as perf- with the brand of performance projects, lots changed in that time frame. So at 2020, I'm now sole, uh, sole operator, sole owner of that business. The other guys went on to do different things. So at 2020, performance project, lockdown hits. We It's chaos. We're still... Uh, um, kind of an immature business. I'm still coaching most of the time. We're doing well, we're getting great results, great feedback, great community, but it's the business isn't working that well because I'm coaching all the time. Um, we we get through the various lockdowns with no future plans in, in sight. It's about getting performance project back on track. However, we see this opportunity because the gyms, are, everything's closed. We're like, right, there's so much work we want to do to this place. We haven't had a chance to do it, right? So now I'm thinking, right, we've got a chance to, do the place up like let's 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 commit to this so we basically when the gyms are shut we think we've got a two month period potentially here three months to renovate let's just go for it so we went for it we completely renovated the place new kit new flooring new lights everything stripped it out made the place look pretty shabby to pretty good um very high sta- like at the time very high standard of a small group gym the whole works did that again the idea then was right so my thought process throughout that uh, the early uh, months of 2020 was I now not thinking longer term, I want to get performance back to back to its feet. I want to raise some investment and capital because the longer term vision is to open more performance project sites. So let's scale. Let's get this place to where it should be post COVID and open more locations. Fast forward to what I said earlier, November, so this is only a few months later, November 2020, I find out that the space is available up the road. So my brain, start, brain starts racking. We've just spent all this money at this location. There's an opportunity to open something new. So the, the brand, Madison's like concept, we think we're doing small group here. I'm not going to move the location because we've just spent all this money on this site. But there's an opportunity, a great opportunity on a high street, a busy high street by the train station, which is like my ideal location. Let's, I'm going to go for it. So we're still coming out the hole with performance project, performance project. We start looking into the concept with Madison's. So the performance project like mission continues. We've now think, right, I'm going to take on this large group gym. We're going to set up Madison's and everything I've said previously about Minka. This starts to like go through my head. So November 2020, I'm still running performance project. We start setting up uh, Madison's. A year later, we end up opening the door. So November 21, we open Madison's and we open Minka literally in the same month, about two weeks apart. We open two new businesses, but I'm still running performance project. We still got a full team, six or seven employees running a small group PT coming out of the back of COVID in and out of lockdowns. We open Madison's and Minka in 2021, November. We continue to run now three businesses. Hectic. I've got two new businesses and one that's just come out of lockdown. Definitely don't recommend that. And then we proceed with the three businesses from November 2021 through to about August 
of 22, and that's where, where we decided to shut down performance projects. We've we've tried we've tried Madison's now as a large group facility. We've got these two studios. It doesn't make sense. We're trying to do something in two. It's too big for just large group. So we shut this one down. <clears throat> what happened? We shut the performance project August 22, and then from August 22 onwards. Madison's becomes this new thing. We've got small group person training in one studio, large group in the other, and then Minka next door. For me, it was one of the hardest months I've probably ever been through. So August 22, very, very difficult because of the stress of all of that. You've got two new businesses, new model, new concept. You're upsetting members from shutting this gym, closing that business down, managing team with that change. And I've opened now, but it was the best thing I did. So really difficult month, but then it, it kind of, it's savage. It's kind of a, a bit, a bit, it's, it's tough for about three months. And after that, it, it was like a weight off the shoulders because I can focus all my attention on these like two a, things. a breakdown and it, to achieve a breakthrough. 100%. Yeah, yeah. And didn't look back. No, best best thing because, again, like I said, prime location, two businesses that are very similar, like brand-wise. We can just put all my energy into less things. Probably like a really heavy decision on your shoulders to, to do that. And you probably thought it through and asked many people, you know, what to do. I'm sure people listening to this right now have got decisions to make in their gyms and their businesses. 100%, yeah. And you think of the mem for me, I always think of the mem any time, like when we think of any decision in the gym, like this, cha like improvements to like, change of an app or like change of pricing or change anything, timetable, I always think of the members and because I know them personally, um, that that often can play a part and sometimes ben like good and bad. But when we when we decided to close the performance project, ultimately long it was the best decision long term for everybody involved because it, it just it just was and it's pro we've proven that. But at the time, I'm thinking of all the members who are going to be upset about this brand and the, and the coaches because we had coaches with us four or five years that like, before what what people knew the community was so strong like people loved it. They've also just come through a lockdown with us. So like for me then to shut that. I then start to think of like what they're going to think of me, of the brand, of like they they don't. I'm thinking further ahead. They don't really know the full. They don't have all the information. I've got all the information as the owner, so I'm kind of worrying about all of that. But I just knew I'm like no, I'm making the decision for the right reasons, and I also know it's the best decision. So Did you lose just, many members? We lost quite a few members. To be fair, it was always sort of random. Some so we lost members for sure. Some of it was because pri when we moved over, it was also a chance to like fix the problems. So one of the problems was pricing. When we when we were running that business, it it just wasn't going to work. We knew right for this to be successful and this this new business to be thriving in a few years. We need to make big, big decisions around pricing and membership. So we changed a few things. And also because the model was now different. So our membership structure looked different. So when we moved people over, some left because of the new structure change. Like they're also, Ultimately, their pricing was going to be different. Uh, higher. Higher. Yeah, higher. So for example, <clears throat> um, the reason, so to give context, when we're at Performance Project, we would run small group personal training, again, all day, every day. So four, four to one. Four to one, same model. So small group, we'd been doing five, six years at four to one every hour on the hour and we had a class area which and we did large group but it was at the very selective times of the day so we had we only did large group at like um 7 a.m maybe 9 30 midday and 7 p.m so like you'd have three or four session classes that and that's it so what we did was all the pt memberships back then you'd have pt access and unlimited classes but we could do that because there was a limited amount of classes so when we moved people to madison's or like when we sorry when we when we started the Madison's brand, small group, we we knew with small group training, we can't have small group personal training and all access classes because we have classes all day. We could you could do that, but people would need to pay appropriately for it. You can't pay for this access and get that access basically. So when we made those changes, um, obviously obviously some people when they when people joined Madison's, but they expected performance project pricing wasn't going to work out. We try to look after people as much as possible, but also got to look after the future business. So some people left for that. Some would have left for reasons we would never know because they don't always give you the real reasons. Maybe we just weren't good enough or they didn't like the change. Um, some said they liked the they liked the like spit and sawdust version and didn't like the new bougie version. Some left because this was nice and new and felt like a younger brand and they liked the old here. Creatures of habit. Yeah, yeah, all sorts. So you literally just moved five less than five minute drive around the corner. Yeah, par yeah, exactly. I mean, now we also we had parking at the door, but sometimes you couldn't always park, and then we moved to somewhere where you can always park, but it might be you might have to walk five minutes. So people like all sorts of random. I'm sure um, a ton of those people came back eventually, and some went missing for good, maybe. Yeah, and some for, rightly some some have moved on, and, and that's some of that is partly true. Some people probably like that. Before, what we had at that brand, it was ultimately a different brand. Like we were doing different things, slightly different culture. 
And some people love that. And they've gone to places now where maybe it's more similar to that and less like Madison's. Because what we did with Madison's is <clears throat> we had a performance project with a slightly older audience. Madison's, when we opened, was a slightly younger audience. And what we did in August 22 was basically sh force two kind of like crowds together. And we've now found ourselves somewhere in the middle. So it was two very different brands, but that was intentional. Because we were opening a brand like Five Minutes Up the Road, we obviously didn't want it to be the same. So Madison's initially was quite a young, trendy brand. Well, sorry, a young, kind of like young working audience, very specifically 20s and 30s. Whereas now it's not the case. It's a much wider audience, and that's that's great. We enjoy that. But the, when we first opened, we had to be very careful because we didn't want two things, doing, the two, two brands doing the same thing. But what we did in August 2020 was basically force two audiences together. And obviously some people didn't like that. What would you say to the gym owner that knows they need to adjust their prices? Uh, it's tough, but just do it. So it's, it's tough. You probably need to do it, but also look inwards and um, thoroughly review what you're doing, like your product, your people. So like we said earlier in the conversation, are you taking your brand seriously? Are you, are you are all your team dressed appropriately? Are you turning up on time? Is your program getting uh, released on time? Um, all, all those things. So you need to look at, well, are, are you, first of all, are you taking your your, your brand seriously? But even in your position when, where you are, um, you most of the time you just need to do it. Just do it, people will be fine. And if they don't, a good conversation we had recently with someone who did this, they increased their price and a load of people left. It's like, well, you're not as good as you think you are. So you're going to learn a lesson. It might be a tough one. Uh, but a lot of the time, without me having all the information, probably do it. But also, you need to be relentless about improving your product, improving your marketing, improving your team CBD. It, it, it's a tough, it's not an easy journey. So you need to be relentless. There's probably a lot of work you need to do inwardly on yourself. Um, not the answer you probably want to hear, but like, uh, it's going to be hard graft. So pricing and increasing them is just one part of that component, but you probably just need to do it. You mentioned JC. Uh, also, Ollie and Jens have had a big uh, part in the development of yourself. Uh, can you just touch upon that? Yeah, so for sure, Oli, so Oli, <clears throat> I've known for a while, so Oli March on for anyone that's watching, someone I met through uh, various other kind of mentorships over the years, <clears throat> maybe back in 2016, probably, the first time, so what I've learned most about Oli and Jens, I talk on Oli just for a second, would be the relentlessness around like products and their people, so for me, early doors, I always took lessons for anyone. So if I was at a mentorship or some sort of group, I'd be taking less, like learning stuff from everyone in that room. But if we na like narrow down to Ollie specifically, it's someone that is relentless around around products and around his people. And that was from from very early when I've vis uh, gone along and kind of spent some time with him. At the time, a very small gym, tiny kind of space, but the energy coming out of that place was incredible. Like they they were delivering sessions. At, it, it was impressive to see someone running a small group with that much passion, the quality of coaches, and you saw from day one the amount of attention they put, the, sorry, the amount of time and attention they put into Team CBD and ultimately the, the product, which was the, what then allowed them to scale. So for me, spending time with guys like that that care that deeply around what they're doing, and then you'll figure out other things along the way. So I know from, there's people, like, everyone's, there's, there's learning to, to, to be made, right? But when when you care that much about the product and the people, they'll then figure out the other things out of the way. So you then start to realize, right, we've got something special here. Members are staying, they're paying good money. Then you start to sort out your operations and your marketing and your sales, stuff like that. But at the core, what I learned most about from 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 Ollie was the care and attention they put into just a, a, a wicked PT session, ultimately. Um, whether it's one-to-one, -one, small group, whatever, in a class, just incredible. And then further that, like later down the line now, since being part of the guy with the guys in the boardroom, it's just that high level of accountability. From, yeah. So just to give context, um, Gym Owner Network is a partner of FMAs. Uh, you're part of Gym Owner Network, which is um, driven by Ollie and Jens. Um, so you just sort of go through what, what's involved with that. So yeah, about maybe about a year ago, so the, the guys uh, have a group called Gym Owner Network. They then um, basically started a higher tier, tier, so the highest level, which is the boardroom. Uh, they ultimately get get people in that group who are at similar levels, maybe struggling with similar things. So experienced gym owners, um, but ultimately want to progress and want to grow. So for me, being a part of that group where we can meet every six weeks and I can have a, a level of accountability where those guys will question me on anything is great. Because for me, I want to be challenged. I want to be, we want, we want to build something very special. I have a high level of accountability anyway, day to day, and I keep myself, I have, I have a strong kind of priorities every day. I feel like I structure my time really well. However, 
having that that the people that I can kind of just run something past. If I've got a decision to run past someone, knowing that they've been there and done it and they're doing it is really helpful because there's lots of people that can talk a good game, but I can see what those guys are doing. It inspires me to do better, but also I can say, right, I'm struggling with this thing or this is like my plan for the next few months. And they, they are ultimately, they've been there and done it. So for me, that's like invaluable. Um, and, I, and I learn a lot from those guys. Bouncing ideas off being in that environment, you just think bigger and yeah. better. Jerome, thank you very much for going in depth on all things Madison and Minka. Uh, the fitness community will love this podcast. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. It was been fun. Enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to the Fitness Marketing Agency podcast. If you enjoyed it, make sure to subscribe so you can catch future episodes.